As a geologist, I study what is going on beneath our feet. Not many people are aware of how many important processes are happening deep into the rocks. We are, as humans, very dependent on these processes, especially in terms of water. Fresh water is very important to our survival as humans, but it's incredibly rare. Of all the water present on our planet, only a few percent, three percent, is available as fresh water. So we are walking now on a on an active riverbank. It's quite amazing. An underground riverbank, then. <laughs> Yes, it's, uh, it's a river that is flowing underground and uh, this is groundwater but normally we actually don't see water flowing out of the rocks this way underground. Yes, yeah, so this is more like groundwater works normally. You got sediments, in this case gravel and you go the water filling in the sediments, a bit like this. Oh look, it's coming down. And then it fills the sediment and that's how the current water okay. is in place. You don't really see it from above. Mm -hmm. If the rock is, uh, is a good storage for groundwater, it can contain a lot of it. A big uh, part of the volume of the rock is actually made of water. So even though we can't see it, so under our feet, there's water within the rocks that we're standing on then? There is water within the rocks and when we use groundwater, we tap into this rock and we extract the water. Either through wells, sometimes pumping the water out, but also sometimes when it comes out in springs, for example, that's how we use the groundwater that is contained in the rocks. So the natural pressure is forcing the, the water out in that case, yeah, in the case that's of springs. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. by understanding where the water is stored, how much water there is, and what is the sustainable use that we can make of this water, we can help populations to use water in the most efficient way possible. Another reason why it's important to understand groundwater systems is that sometimes they can be contaminated, and they can be contaminated by humans, but they can also be contaminated naturally by chemicals like arsenic. Hi Marina, how are you? Hi Claudia, I'm doing very well, how are you? Yeah, yeah, not too bad. How is your work going in Mendoza? Uh, that's going well. Um, I'll tell you a bit about Mendoza and uh, how the water management works. So Mendoza is next to the Andes Mountains and the main source of water for the province comes from snow because rainfall is scarce. So the main source of water in summertime comes from the thawing of the snow. And where water does not arrive or is insufficient, groundwater is used. The groundwater quality is um, it's okay in some areas, but there is an issue in the eastern area of the province where, because of the geology, there's quite a lot of arsenic present. To extract groundwater, people use conventional windmills and a local traditional bucket type well that is operated manually. Studies in the area show that the origin of arsenic is related to the composition of sediments from the Andes Mountains. So arsenic is present in groundwater because of the conditions underground. 
for example, a certain pH, high presence of fine sediments, or the balance of oxygen, this causes arsenic to mobilize or be released from the rock to the water. In Latin America, there are several removal technologies available. However, it is important to develop technologies and methods for small-scale operations and rural environments like in Mendoza and other arid environments in the world. As fresh water is a precious and rare resource, we also need to be able to protect it. We have to be mindful of the ways that we can pollute aquifers. Economic activities at large scale, industry and agriculture have an impact. For me, it felt like we all need to eat and we all need to work out how we're going to produce food sustainably um, in the face of climate change um, and, yeah, need to produce food in a sustainable way. So it felt like a very kind of worthwhile job, basically. And we've been farming here at Pitney for, this is our fifth season as tenant farmers here. By farming, you then get to be a land manager and by being a land manager, you then get to have personally have a positive hopefully Inside, positive yeah, yeah, impact yeah. on your on your local environment which then hopefully sort of is has an impact on the on the broader environment as well so these these are the tunnels and they're really useful for this time of year the hungry yeah. gap so this is the point where in the field like um, we've just started to cultivate so the last of the winter crops are um, being turned into the soil and the new crops are just being planted but they're not ready yet. So it's yeah. the time of year when there's like the least amount to sell yeah, basically. That's when, you that's when we make the most of the tunnels, and yeah. yeah. And we do lots of interstop into that um, wet garden. One of the problems with, with groundwater is of course uh, potential pollution. In large scale farming, because of the use of pesticides and the fertilizer, or too much use of that. So if we have leakages of chemicals, you can pollute the aquifer. Then it's very difficult to get rid actually of uh, this contamination. The water travels very slowly in the ground, a few centimeters per day, and it can take a few years to do just 100 meters or something wow. like that. Wow. Mm -hmm. so, so you see that the process of cleaning up an aquifer can be very time consuming mm -hmm. and uh, kind of technically uh, challenging. Mm -hmm. I think farming has been a big emitter up until now, mm -hmm. um, but I think it has a huge potential for being uh, one of the solutions. Organic farming doesn't make use of using chemicals, either chemical fertilizers, chemical herbicides, pesticides, fungicides. In organic farming, we rely on natural systems and, and natural cycles, but also natural sources of fertility and utilizing the local ecology and cultural practices to combat um, diseases and pests. How do we know if there is groundwater beneath our feet and how much of it? Traditionally, we dig into the ground, make boreholes to tap into this groundwater, into these aquifers. But these traditional boreholes reach from tens to very few hundreds of meters. A new solution for areas where this is not enough is to look deeper. For looking very deep into the rocks, we also need new data. 
We are now using a special type of data, geological and geophysical data, that has been traditionally acquired and used by a completely different industry, the oil and gas industry. We've been able actually to recycle data. So as a side effect of their activities, we are left with a huge geological and geophysical database which can tell us also about aquifers that lay hundreds to thousands of meters beneath our feet. With the predicted increase in populations and the changes in climate, it is important that we also understand what we can do in our homes to protect our fresh water resources in general and the environment. So thank you so much for having us, for inviting us into your house. You and your family are very environmental conscious So because we've been talking about groundwater mm -hmm. and the importance to protect our water resources. Uh, we would like to ask you if you can share some tips on uh, how we can save uh, water in our houses. It's my pleasure to have you here today, Claudia. So yeah, I'm very happy to. So the first thing is just general good maintenance, I suppose. Make sure that our taps don't drip, fix any leaks that we've got. Don't leave taps running when cleaning teeth and generally waste as little water as possible. We've also made some changes. We've fitted Pulse Eco shower heads. We've had a hot water tap installed. There's a tank of nearly boiling water that sits under there and it's a very, very efficient um, way of reducing your hot water usage and also your water usage. I see that you got some uh, glass uh, milk bottles, right? So by doing that, by recycling more, reusing a lot of this material, we can also reduce the amount of water that we use uh, to produce all these uh, materials. As you can see, this is our very high-tech uh, water <laughs> collection system held together with um, children's tape there. But what this does is it collects the rainwater as it comes down that pipe, which gathers oh, yeah. everything from this yeah, side yeah. of the roof. Um, and then this pipe takes the water all the way down to the bottom of the garden to the water storage down there. So down here we've got the raised beds and we've got four water butts for water storage. Two of them are connected directly from the pipe that gathers water from the roof of the house. And then we have two additional reserve water storage containers yes. as well. Thank you so much for sharing all these tips. It's very interesting to see how we can all make a difference and they are quite simple tips that we can all implement in our houses. Absolutely, my pleasure. It is essential to understand our water resources like the ground we stand on, it supports our way of living. We are expecting problems with overpopulations and the increase in industrial activities and agricultural activity will put more and more stress on our resources. And therefore, we have to be very mindful of the way we use it. We have to be able to protect it.